Today on the podcast, we're moving through part 16 in our story about the life and art of Disney designer Herb Ryman. We are now up to the part where Ryman works with Walt to design Disneyland in 1953, 1954, and 1955. And this material includes some of the seminal stories about the development of Walt's first park. I realize that some listeners tune into these episodes months or even years after they are first posted. But if you're listening to these episodes when they first go up, you will be hearing stories about the development of Disneyland in the days leading up to Disneyland's birthday. As I'm recording this, we're in the month of July, heading toward the 68th anniversary of the opening of Walt's original park. And here on the podcast, both this week and next, we'll look at how Herb Ryman contributed to its early designs. As we left off last time, it was Saturday morning in late September 1953. Walt was calling Ryman at home, where he worked on his circus paintings, to see if he might come over to the studio to help with a special project. And that is exactly where we'll pick up the story this time. So, if you're ready, here we go. Fifteen or twenty minutes after their phone conversation, Ryman found Walt waiting for him outside of the studio, standing with his old friends from Fox, Dick Irvine, and Marvin Davis. He also found Walt's brother-in-law, Bill Cottrell. Cottrell waved a greeting. Once inside, Walt explained that for the past year, he'd been developing an amusement park, a project that began as a modest enterprise, but had recently grown to an impressive size. It was different than the park described in the local paper the previous year. Walt offered examples of the different themed areas he intended to include, as well as the rides. There would be a frontier area, a jungle area, even a circus area with a big top and various shows. Not quite sure how to respond, Ryman asked, well, where are these drawings? I'd like to see them. Walt lifted his eyes so that his gaze met Ryman's. You're going to make them, he said. Walt explained that his brother was going to New York on Monday, hopefully to secure money from a TV network to help build the park. This park, at least for now, wouldn't be part of Walt Disney Productions. Instead, it would exist as a project developed by two new companies. The company that would design the park was called Wed Enterprises and was housed at least for now at the studio, though the salaries of Wed employees were paid directly by Walt. The park, once it was built, would be owned and operated by a second company to be called Disneyland Incorporated, an entity that might eventually have multiple investors. This arrangement allowed for Walt to fully own the design company WED, while selling off shares of the park itself, Disneyland Incorporated, to corporate investors. The arrangement also allowed Walt, in terms of the park, to maintain managerial independence from the studio. This was why Walt needed to raise money for the project. Though Walt Disney Productions had money, Disneyland Incorporated did not, except for the money that Walt himself put into it. Uh, my brother has to take a large rendering of Disneyland with him to show investors, Walt explained. You know, most financial types don't have much imagination. Roy has to show them what we're going to do before we can have any chance of getting the money. This rendering Walt wanted Herbie to make would be configured as an aerial map with all of the rides and themed areas arranged into a unified drawing. The map was particularly important because Walt did not yet own the land where he wanted to build the park. He had an option to buy land in Anaheim, but didn't yet have the money to finalize the purchase. Therefore, this park didn't yet have a firm address. Its location only existed on paper. If network executives and accountants saw a map of the park, hopefully they would see it as a real place, something far more developed than a set of ideas. 
Ryman then understood the reason he had been called. The men working on this project, such as Irvine and Davis, were architects and art directors, not illustrators or sketch artists. Ryman was an illustrator and a layout artist and knew how to organize a complex plan into a single drawing in such a way that the emotional tones of the project radiated out to viewers. This, essentially, was what Ryman had done at MGM and Fox. He took rough sketches done by an art director and created finished paintings and illustrations that defined exactly how a scene would appear on screen. This map, with some trial and error, would essentially take two days, assuming Ryman was able to work quickly. It was a favor far larger than anything previously requested by Walt, even the portrait of Sharon. For similar work at MGM or Fox, Ryman would have been given weeks to understand the material and complete such a drawing. Initially, he told Walt that he'd rather not make this map because he didn't believe he could finish it to everyone's satisfaction over the weekend. It will embarrass me, he said, and it will embarrass you. He then saw a change come over Walt, some of the confidence draining from his face. Walt leaned in, his voice soft. Will you do it if I stay? After a moment's consideration, Ryman said, Yes, if you stay Saturday and Sunday night. With an agreement in place, Bill Cottrell, Marvin Davis, and Dick Irvine showed Ryman concepts for individual rides and explained how they would fit into themed areas. Overall, the park would resemble a massive studio backlot with a frontier area, a turn of the Century Street, and even a jungle. In looking at the sketches, Ryman understood that the park wasn't primarily related to the types of films that Disney made. There were touches, of course, such as in the fantasy area. Most of the park, however, was an adaptation of live-action film genres made by other studios. The turn of the Century Street, for example, was reminiscent of the small-town New England Street at MGM, with its residential houses and town square. This area also looked a little like the Midwestern Street and train station over on the Fox lot. Likewise, the frontier area wasn't a historic recreation of the American West. It was a vision of the West as arranged in popular movies, but once more not movies produced by Disney. The frontier area contained elements of the western streets over at MGM, a quartet of sets located on one of their satellite lots, combined with elements of Tombstone Street at Fox. Beyond the street itself, out on the river, just beyond the frontier area, the park held a steamboat that looked similar to the steamship built a couple of years back on the MGM lot for the film Showboat. Irvine and Davis continued to explain the layout, but for Ryman, it was fairly straightforward. The park would have a single entryway that progressed to a circular hub. A castle, not unlike the castle once partially built at MGM, served as the park's focal point, around which were organized the other backlot areas. After the Disney team finished their presentation, they left so Walt and Ryman might work alone. For years, Ryman had been an artist who believed personal experience was central to creating an authentic image. He liked to occupy a location before he painted it, and if he couldn't occupy it, he studied photos. But for this project, he would rely on drawings made by others to create a vision that not only defined the place, but also communicated its mood. As he tried to organize this project in his mind, he once more doubted his abilities. I'll stay here and do something, Ryman said, but it won't be any good. Walt indicated that that was okay. Ryman only needed to do the best he could in the time available, as any map was better than what they presently had. Ryman took a seat at a drafting table and again sifted through individual drawings. It was an unusual project, part amusement park and part backlot tour. He knew that Walt was not infallible, but he believed that he had a prophetic wisdom 
that allowed him to understand what the public wanted before the public itself knew. He could see strains of that wisdom in this park. Ryman knew that the new medium of TV was reshaping how Americans related to entertainment. Americans like to feel close to their movies and TV shows. Ten years ago, Americans needed to go out to a theater to watch a movie. Now Americans watch those same movies and some new TV shows at home. This park would be an extension of America's growing love affair with all things produced in Hollywood. Another way to feel close to the movies. Somewhere around noon, Ryman put lead to vellum and began to experiment with ways to combine individual concepts into a unified drawing. He started with a simple sketch, a loose model, and proceeded from there. I realized that this rendering had to be very large, Ryman said, so the bankers could see it and talk about it, and I thought the storyboard size, which is 4 by 8 feet, would be just right. For the rest of the day, Ryman roughed out quick lines guided by Walt. He worked with charcoal and carbon pencil. Walt would gesture at the drawing, sometimes with a finger, other times with a cigarette. When we worked on the castle... Ryman later recalled, Walt wanted it to be hundreds of feet high. He said, when people get near us, I want them to say, look, there's the castle. That's Disneyland. Let's go over there. Ryman centered the castle in the middle of the drawing, stretching its height for emphasis. The castle inside the proportions of the drawing was about 800 feet high. It was unrealistic but visually effective as an illustration that conveyed an idea and a mood more than an actual landscape. With each subsequent section, Ryman lowered himself through Walt's words more deeply into his vision. With line work so thick and sure, the park started to look real. Twin steamboats, a coal-burning railroad chuffing around a track, and a single-stage rocket nosing toward the sky. Behind the turn of the century street was a little alley filled with a big top and a second tent for sideshow performers, similar to those tents used by Ringling Brothers. When it was done, Ryman said, I put a little color on it. I just rubbed color pencil and pastel on it. The final map, Ryman felt, was serviceable, but it was far from his best efforts. I'm not very proud of it, he said. But both he and Walt believed that it would convey the idea of the park to business managers who worked in TV. Roy left for New York before Ryman's illustration was complete. In his absence, Bill Cottrell made a copy, or more likely copies, to be kept at the studio. The following day, Tuesday, September 29th, he airmailed Ryman's original illustration to Roy with other pitch materials sent the following day. The pitch book used by Roy described Disneyland as a new experience in entertainment, an educational amusement park where guests would find happiness and knowledge. It also described a series of TV shows that Walt was willing to make for a sponsoring network, from the Zorro Westerns to a weekly anthology show to a short musical show for children. Initially, Roy took the materials to CBS, who were not interested. Then he set up a meeting with a junior executive at NBC. But by that point, he understood that it would take a while to find a partner in network TV if a partner was to be found at all. That fall, Ryman developed his circus paintings along with whatever work Fox threw his way. But he was open to other possibilities if they interested him. One project that grew out of his work at Fox was the opportunity to illustrate a novel. Based on the success of the film The Black Rose, Doubleday, a New York publisher, wanted to re-release the hardcover novel on which the film was based. The novel, first published in 1945, had already sold 2 million copies. But Doubleday believed that a lavishly illustrated edition would capture a new round of sales. Doubleday arranged for Ryman to create the illustrations, illustrations not unlike those he had made to lay out the film. The cover of the book featured both the author's name, Thomas B. Custain, and, in a smaller font, Herbie's name.
When Ryman talked to Walt about this project, he seemed confused as to why Ryman, with his work at Fox, would take on an assignment to illustrate a novel, a job that almost surely paid less than his other assignments. Walt understood Ryman's interest with the circus. As a boy, Walt, too, had loved the circus, but the illustration assignment confused him. After listening to Walt's criticism, Ryman framed his reply in a way that his old boss would understand. Uh, you like Walt Disney Presents on a film, I like my name on a book. To this, Walt simply replied, okay. Another opportunity arrived when Dr. Hubert Eaton, founder of Forest Lawn Memorial Parks and Mortuaries, talked with Ryman about creating a 65-foot-long mural depicting the resurrection of Christ for a cemetery chapel. Impressed by Ryman's set design work on biblical epics for Fox, Eaton believed that he could bring a cinematic sense of grandeur to the Easter story in a mural format that would, in essence, mimic the presentation of a widescreen film. For Forest Lawn, Ryman would use the artistic traditions of Hollywood to remake the emotional space at a cemetery a project that shared some design values with the Hollywood-infused amusement park that Walt wanted to build. For the remainder of 1953 and well into 1954, the Disney brothers focused on solidifying a funding source to create this park. In New York, after multiple meetings, Roy learned that NBC, just like CBS, didn't want to entangle itself with an amusement park simply to receive TV shows produced by Walt Disney. But the ABC Paramount Network appeared interested. In terms of affiliates and viewership, ABC lagged behind NBC and CBS with no shows in the top 10. Executives at ABC understood that their network, with some smart programming, might catch up. They also understood that it might go bankrupt. Because of this, Roy Disney made a handshake deal with network executive Leon Goldenson at ABC. ABC would receive exclusive access to TV shows produced by Disney, and in return, Disney would receive a half-million-dollar investment in the park, as well as an ABC-backed loan for an additional $4.5 million. But this deal still needed to be approved by the network's board of directors, where Goldenson would surely face opposition. At social gatherings, Ryman noticed that Walt's interests were more deeply directed at this new amusement park than they were at films. At parties, Walt openly solicited opinions about rides and other amusements his team was exploring, a boat ride with animals, a flight to the moon, and a river journey on a steamship. All of these plans existed in a strange no-man's land, a project that moved forward in the hope that the ABC board would approve the Disney offer. At the end of spring, either the final days of March or the start of April, Walt called Herbie with good news. We got the money to do the park, he said. I'm glad I could help, Ryman replied. Then Walt took in a breath the way he did when he was about to make a request. Oh, well, Walt added, would you come in and help with the project? Ryman thought about this. Surprisingly, he wasn't opposed to working for Walt's new company, WED, a company that consciously repurposed the skills of Hollywood art directors, architects, and sketch artists to create this unusual park. Ryman's circus paintings were still moving forward, but he couldn't live off their sales. Likewise, he was still working for Fox, but the signs were everywhere that Fox, along with other studios, would continue to pare back theatrical features as viewers migrated from the big to the small screen. Beyond the financial realities of studio work, Ryman saw something else that intrigued him in the Disneyland project. This project relied on skills he'd developed for 20 years. If he took on this assignment, his sketches and paintings wouldn't shape a movie. 
They would shape a park, something whose lifespan would be significantly longer than the typical two or three months that a movie stayed in theaters. Moreover, he might be able to use some of those studies he had made of Europe and Asia to frame areas of the park with international influence, such as Fantasyland and Adventureland. He thought that this park project might be uh, just as interesting as my circus paintings. Yeah, he told Walt, I'll come and help you. They made an arrangement about salary and office space. Ryman would have an office near Dick Irvine, Marvin Davis, and another new hire, Bill Martin, all of whom came from the art department at Fox. With Ryman on board, roughly 20% of the old Fox art department was now on the Disney lot. But There was one more aspect of his employment that Ryman wanted to discuss. In the seven years since Ryman had worked for Disney, he had come to believe that multi-year contracts changed a person. They allowed artists to become part of an organization and to give up their individuality and unique vision. A play Ryman had seen had helped him clarify his ideas, a stage production called Cyrano de Bergerac. In it, Cyrano explained that only a few people were strong and gifted like old oak trees and that others like ivy threaded themselves around the trunk of the oak for support. These people cozied up to patrons, not studio heads, but still the point was the same. With a reliable income from either a patron or a studio head, artists stopped striving to improve themselves. Just like the ivy curled around a tree, they now had a reliable system of support. In this, Ryman believed that Walt was the sturdy oak tree filled with original ideas and coiled around him like ivy were artists who relied on his vision. Ryman didn't want to be the ivy. After a few gallery shows in New York, he also sensed that he would never be the oak tree. Instead, Ryman saw himself as a small sapling, a tree that stood on its own like the oak, but was smaller, perhaps easy to overlook. But he was happy with this arrangement. I don't want to sign a contract, Ryman said, because I want you to be able to fire me anytime you want to. Conversely, I want to be able to leave anytime things get dull here. Walt explained that by doing this, Ryman was giving up benefits others would receive under contract. Walt also suggested that Ryman perhaps wasn't seeing the larger picture. The park, assuming it was successful, would be a way for his work to be appreciated by millions, that it would give him a very large audience, even if his name wasn't on it. Ryman understood what Walt was trying to convey, but his feelings about the issue were complicated. Even though he was moving into middle age, Ryman still held on to a young man's dream that his own paintings might someday have a strong following in the world of art, a dream that was, day by day, becoming less likely, as young artists with their fresh visions typically captured the art world. The dream, as it occupied his mind, was still too bright to give up, as it had defined his life for over two decades. Not long ago, he had tried to explain this to Walt, when he had taken on work to illustrate the hardcover reissue of The Black Rose, but this explanation had been lost on him. Instead of revisiting this conversation, Ryman changed tactics. I'd love to work on this, he said, as long as it's fun. This was something that Walt could understand, as a lack of creative engagement was the reason Ryman had left the studio at the end of the war. I'll try to make it fun, Walt said. From there, a renewed closeness opened up between Ryman and his old boss, something beyond the rapport he had felt after finishing the portrait of Sharon. They were more than friends. They were now comrades, two people focused on the same project. As work was always the core of Walt's life, Ryman was now back in the thick of it, in Walt's inner circle, just as he had been in South America and during the early days of the war. 
at the studio he was bundled with Dick Irvine, Marvin Davis, and Bill Martin, where they explored how to make Walt's idea for a park into a reality. The first thing we worked on, Ryman said, was the appearance of Main Street, the entry under the railroad, and we worked on the hub, and of course, naturally, the castle was a very conspicuous element, because that was to be the theme of the whole park. Ryman penciled out images of what was then called the World of Tomorrow, a land where lily pad umbrellas shaded guests and an upright rocket waited for passengers to climb its stairs. For Ryman, Tomorrowland was the most difficult area to conceptualize. All his life he'd created drawings by either experiencing a location or by looking at photos. Now he had to visualize a land based on the futuristic visions developed by other artist and presented in film. Nobody knew what to do with Tomorrowland, Ryman said. We didn't know what kind of a rocket would go to the moon or outer space. Ryman worked through ideas with a pencil and pen. In one drawing, he arranged the entrance to the world of tomorrow around a series of fountains, the fountains of the 48 states which offered a stately vision of the future, but this idea was rejected. In other drawings, he visualized the entrance to Tomorrowland as a fountain arranged around the sculpture of atoms. This molecular structure turned around jets that lifted streams of water high into the air. The project progressed into a model, just as other studios such as Fox and MGM now used models to develop sets, so did Walt when working on this park. Bob Maddy, who worked in special effects in film, outfitted this model with a miniature electronic system to create movement. Maddy wasn't part of the design team, at least not yet, but like others at the studio as time allowed, he pitched in to develop a few early projects. It was a very nice model, Ryman explained. Once it was functioning, Ryman brought Walt into Maddie's workspace so he could see its movement, the atomic sculpture turning and the fountain sending up lines of water. Walt stared at the model arranged on a work table. Both men could see that he wasn't particularly pleased. Oh, what's that, Walt said. Oh, well, Maddie said, that's the fountain that's going to be at the entrance to Tomorrowland. Walt continued to examine it, though now his eyebrows were pushed together with confusion. Well, what does it do? Maddie looked from Walt to Ryman, then back to Walt. Well, it's Herbie's idea. Herbie thought it would be nice to have this fountain. It would be going up and down. There would be a lot of water. They both could see that Walt was still confused as to how water and a giant molecule would represent the future. They tried to explain its visual appeal, how guests would be drawn to the water, especially on hot summer days. But they now knew that this concept would go no further. The WED team would need to design yet another entrance for the world of tomorrow. During these months, the designers worked as a team, passing drawings back and forth, often choosing to speak with images rather than words. But the art directors from Fox weren't the only people that Walt had hired to work on Disneyland. He had hired Nat Weinkoff, a man who functioned as a type of business manager who would later promote the park. He'd also hired a husband and wife team, Owen and Dolly Pope, who used a makeshift stable at the back of the studio to raise horses, mules, and other livestock that eventually would live at the park. Walt regularly walked back to the stables to visit the animals. He loved the little animals, Ryman explained. The little horses, ponies, and mules, that were really the first employees at Disneyland. But for now, this was the nucleus of the Disneyland project a small design team, a business manager, and two animal handlers who would also build the stagecoaches. On those weekends, when Walt wasn't at his vacation home in Palm Springs, he often dined at Bill Cottrell's house. You see, I was much closer to the Walt Disney family, Ryman explained, because Walt's sister-in-law and brother-in-law, Bill and Hazel Cottrell, were my neighbors down the street. They were my good friends, and probably it was Hazel who would say, well, why don't we invite over Herbie, or let's invite Herbie and his mother. 
Unlike executives at Fox or MGM, Walt had very little interest in celebrity culture, even though his image was regularly featured in papers. He was content with middle-class pleasures. He liked spending time at home and with family. He liked to watch TV. When he did go out, he went to quiet affairs such as a small dinner. He also liked to attend backyard picnics at the Cottrell's house. The picnics were casual affairs, typically fried chicken and cornbread, arranged around a backyard table. Often, it was only the extended Disney family, along with Herbie and his mother. As Cottrell lived in a suburban neighborhood, his backyard was enclosed with a cedar fence. Though the children in the neighborhood understood that from time to time Walt Disney visited. One such girl, maybe nine years old, lived next door and seemed insistent that the family notice her. While the Disneys and the Cottrells were eating, she might call over the fence and ask how they were doing. Then one day she took things a bit further. She dragged out a kitchen stepladder and set it next to the fence, allowing her to see over the top of it. Hazel, growing irritated, said to Walt, She always does this. Most everyone around the table agreed that her antics were a problem, but Walt, looking up at the girl, understood the situation from a different perspective. Oh, Hazel, she's just lonesome, Walt said. That's all. She's lonesome. After a little conversation, the girl retreated back inside her house. But this was another moment that stayed with Ryman, allowing him to see that a pool of generosity rested inside the big man. At least sometimes Walt was able to see acquaintances just how they needed to be seen. She didn't know she was a pest, and she wanted a little bit of attention, Ryman concluded. And I thought this was, to me, a very revealing aspect of Walt's understanding of people. In this way, relying on a series of experiences, Ryman was able to see Walt from many angles. He could see him as a friend, a boss, a frustrated studio head, and an innovator. At times, Ryman could assemble these pieces in his mind to create a picture of this person who had occupied so much of his adult life. At one time, Ryman explained, Walt was a Missouri farm boy, like Edison, enthusiastic about everything. Another time, he said, I never knew the Walt Disney who was the harsh dictator at the studio. I knew the Walt Disney who was the father of his two daughters and the family man. Yet another time, he said, As you know by now, Walt Disney was a rather unsophisticated, quite simple person. Not a world-renowned philosopher, not a do-gooder, not a religious fanatic, but a very normal, ordinary person with a genius for knowing and caring what people wanted and what they would enjoy. Still another time, he said, I think the fact that Walt Disney remained a child, and as long as he lived, he maintained a continual extraordinary enthusiastic curiosity, a curiosity for everything, combined with a tremendous respect for people and for animals. He loved animals, he loved life, he loved nature. I suppose this was part of his farm inheritance. He was very fond of everything. Yet this gaze, this sense of understanding, worked both ways, from Ryman to Walt and vice versa. This very normal, ordinary person from the Midwest also seemed to understand what motivated Ryman. Ryman wanted to inhabit the art world of the early 20th century, when artists were celebrated for their ability to capture a subjective vision of reality in a painting. Ryman wanted to find success on his own terms, but the world of art, at least as Walt saw it, was changing. The mass audience for art wasn't in museums or galleries, at least not anymore. It was in film and perhaps in this theme park he wanted to build. The role of the artist was changing, but Ryman, like many artists, was still tied to old goals, those deep inside of the alluring world of art they had known back when they were young. 
I'll be back next week to continue our story of Herb Ryman as he works with Walt and other Disney artists in the months leading up to the opening of Disneyland. As you know, we're an ad-free, listener-supported podcast. We do just two things. Deep dives on stories related to the history of the Disney studio and the parks, and news and analysis of current events as they relate to the Disney company. We are funded entirely by listener contributions. On Bandcamp, you'll find over 200 episodes not available on iTunes or anywhere else. But the best reason to become a monthly subscriber is to support the work we do here and to make sure that this podcast continues to exist. You can become a monthly subscriber at dhipodcast.bandcamp.com. I'll also leave a link down in the show notes. Until next Sunday, this is Todd James Pierce.